Hello and welcome to an introduction to the Rhodes Chroma. Uh, my name is David Hobson and you can't see me. But my name is under my YouTube thing. Okay, obviously it's not scripted and um, I'm going to air. We all air. And so... If you're looking for perfection in a video, uh, you need to look somewhere else. Also, this being just a introduction to the chroma, which will be a, a pretty long introduction since it's such a deep instrument, um, I'm going to miss things um, because I'm going to make follow-up videos. Uh, because right now this chroma is on my mind and it's it's on it's it's um right in front of me and it's in my front room in a prime location because i love it i love it i love it so i'm not going to give you all the history on the chroma and so i guess to begin with i would like to say that um there's a website on the internet um, called RhodesChroma.com and uh, it is a wonderful resource. I mean, it, it just has, it has created a, uh, it has gathered a community of Chroma owners who understand the value of this powerful and wonderful instrument. Uh, gathering together technicians, uh, techs from all over who have developed uh, upgrades for the chroma to make it um, a, uh, a viable and a lasting a lasting instrument that will um, stand the test of time I guess and 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 maybe maybe even when I when I'm 80, when I'm 80 years old uh, it'll be still working um, so far nothing is burned out but all those technicians that have worked have made what you see in front of you possible. And, um, and so what I'm going to explain first is the Rhodes Chroma. Now, like I said, if you want the history of the Rhodes Chroma, when it was made, uh, that it was an actually the ARP Chroma, and it was just merely put together by Fender because ARP was going bankrupt and all that kind of stuff. Well, there's books on it, and you can... Go to RhodesChroma.com, Chris Ryan. Great guy, wonderful resource, dedicated, and you can become part of the Chroma Talk group if you're interested in more. And I have my instruments, my instruments registered on Chroma, and I have other instruments that I do not have registered on Rhodes Chroma in, in the registry. Um, but this is my favorite one and it has been fully refurbished, um, by me and, um, my favorite, now my favorite guy in the world, uh, Sam Masuko at Three Wave Music, who's helped me with the, uh, with this wonderful, I think this is Curly Maple. Yes, Curly Maple. It's not, it's not Fiddleback Maple, it's, uh. You know, whatever it is, it's curly maple. It's not bird's eye. I know that because bird's eye has a... Anyway, that's that's the wood I chose to replace the original cherry. And um, so I'm basically just, uh, what the kids say, giving a shout out to um, the people who um, have helped made all of this possible. Okay, so I bought this chroma in um, 1996, 95, I don't remember, okay, sorry, but uh, I was at a shop, a local shop in my, in a town that I used to live in, uh, and a guy named Ivan, um, who ran the shop, 
I, I frequented his shop because at the time I was trying to snatch up as many analog synths as I could before this whole eBay craze started. And now, you know, things have gone way up. Back when people were making virtual uh, analogs. And so I, I kind of saw that was could have happened maybe. I, I didn't have the internet at the time. And so I would I would visit lots of music stores and you would find things, you know, sometimes for 20 bucks, 30 bucks. They thought it was um, hunks of junk. They didn't know what it was. And well, it was my fortune, um, God in his providence, um, managed to uh, create the circumstances to for me to find this chroma in Ivan's shop. So I saw it, and it had the cherry wood, and it was stained because it gets stained in the uh, in the thing. Oh, by the way, uh, this is going to be a long video. So, you know, if I'm talking and I'm not doing anything right now, that's coming. And don't worry, it'll be like uh, nine hours long or something. I don't know. So I'm, so I'm looking at it, and it has the original cherry wood in this shop. And uh, it, was, it was stained because it gets stained in the foam case as it rots, I guess. It didn't have a case with it. It was just sitting there. And I walked in. I said, hey, Ivan. I looked over at it, and um, it was uh, dirty up here, and it was stained and stuff. And, uh, of course, it, uh, it, doesn't, it didn't look as nice as it looked as it looks now but it was just covered with years of tobacco basically nicotine and somebody probably spilled beers on it and whatever and i saw it and i said what's that he said i i don't know it's a it's a rhodes chroma i said oh and i was thinking to myself okay another electric piano i don't want that i'm a programmer i like to uh program everything computers uh synthesizers i like to be able to actually touch knobs and not just press membrane switches and find my way through little menus and stuff to try to adjust one parameter at the time that's the kind of synthesizers i'm drawn to and i, I like showing my hands so that you know that i'm actually active in this whole process here i'll even take a, a drink of water here's the glass have you ever seen a glass i mean you can't tell how big my hands are but they're actually quite huge but that's a huge glass of water just a second. And I, um, I'm away from the mic, but now I'm close. I'm not going to set my glass of water on the freaking chroma. That just ain't going to happen. In this world or the next, where there will be no chromas. That's why we play them here. So, um, anywho, uh, he said to me, yeah, I don't know what it is. Uh, and I said, oh, another electric piano. And I said, well, uh, but, but what's all the buttons? He said, well, I think it's a synthesizer. I don't think it's an electric piano. And then I saw the membrane switches, and I was like, huh, there must be something to this. I was seeing the modulation select, uh, modulation depth, wave shape, uh, low pass, high pass. I could recognize by then some of these things. And I had a feel for synthesizers by this time, analog synths, because I own several, you know. And so, but at that time, I only owned a couple. I think a Prophet 5 that I got from West Taggart um, Analogics in Ohio. And I still own that Prophet 5. And then, um, so to see something like this, there's only a supposedly 3,000 that have, that have been made ever. And so that means, I guess, if you are very generous with uh, statistics, uh, there's probably maybe, I don't know, I really don't know, a thousand that are operable at this point? I don't know, maybe maybe more or less? I don't know, maybe, maybe far less than that. It's definitely a rare beast, so... Um, so uh, but I had a feel for this, and I could read even as rare and as um, uh, interesting as it is, I could understand that there was something more to it than, than Ivan was saying and that, uh, and that I comprehended. So I said, uh, could we plug it in? And he said, yeah, it just makes noise. I mean, you just press it and then all you hear is noise. 
And sure enough, he, he brought me out a, a cord and um, he plugged it into an amp, you know, and it made noise, made white noise. You know, you press a key and it would just go, you know, it just make this crazy white noise. And then um, I said, well, is there any way to program it? I mean, he said, well, there's a box that came with it. And um, so I said, okay. And uh, and uh, he brought out the box and there was a, a foot switch, you know, and not, not the foot pedal for it. I, I, you can't find one of those, but I'm making one uh, out of a Yamaha pedal. I can I can do that, and then I'll have a, a volume control or whatever, a modulation pedal, whatever. Uh, but I was foot switch to kind of switch through the programs, or you can program it to do things. A cassette player, of course, which was like, oh, okay, it's one of these. And so you got to do tape dump. And I thought, did you try doing the tape dump? He said, no, no, I, I didn't do, try doing the tape dump. And I, I said, okay. So I started messing around with it, and I asked for headphones, and I plugged it in, you know, because there was some of the patches. You select them here, you know. You select the patches. There's 50. And I started pressing them, and they were just, some of them really quiet, making real strange little noises like, you know real soft you know i didn't know what the heck that was there's another one that's just going you know just real crazy sounds so i decide okay um i start messing around uh parameter select um uh, let's go to filter cutoff you know uh, let's go to low pass high pass tune they call it on the chroma tune so that's your filter cutoff is your tune i guess and it's got its own lingo pretty much, and um, sweep is LFO and stuff. And so I started messing with that, and pretty soon I figured out that this was a functioning synthesizer of some depth and that it actually did work and that it just didn't have a tape dump, a fresh tape dump, and that the battery must have been, must be dead or something. I, I don't know, and I, I, I just thought, okay, um, I'm going to buy this before somebody else snatches it up. I said, I'm, I'm successfully programming here a little bit. I don't know much about it. So I asked him how much and he said, well, I'm not looking to make a fortune off the thing. And I'm, I'm getting ready to wheel and deal because I'm willing to do that. He said, how about, uh, 75 bucks? And I said, <sighs> you know, I was like, I was trying to make it look like, hmm, this is a hard decision. I was thinking he was going to tell me like 500 bucks. Okay, I, I was ready to to drop down 500 bucks for this and take it to Wes and get Wes Taggart to uh, tune it up for me. You know, But he said 75, so I, I didn't have the 75 on me though. So I went home and I grabbed a, a mixing board, uh, an old... Tascam or something, some piece of junk, an RCA, I don't even know. It's It wasn't worth much. And so Ivan is a really good guy. I brought him back that Tascam, and uh, here's my hand again, and I got, I traded it for this. So basically, I got the thing for, I think it was like 45 or 50 bucks. I think that's how it happened, you know, as I'm, as I'm remembering this now. So for 50 bucks... I got a Chroma. I took it to West Tagger at Analogix. I drove it over to his to his home. I have a picture with him wheeling it away from my truck in the back of his home to his uh, barn where he fixes his stuff. And he's great. You know, he's a great technician. He's you know he's um, quoted in books. Mark Vale's book. You know vintage synthesizers and stuff and so I knew that he could fix it so he did a couple of things to it and um I got it home and um uh, and sure enough it was um it was fine um and uh I start playing with the factory patches now it, it holds 50 so um I installed what was on the tape that came with it it said factory set one two three four five on some of the cassettes. Some of the cassettes were from the guy who had previously owned it and all that. So I just decided, let's do a tape dump of the factory patches. So I connected the cord, which is in 
back there's a connector for a cassette dump and then it'll it blinks as it's receiving the uh the pulsing data um you know each patch being loaded and you know i went through them and i said man this sounds great you know so um now where whereas i don't have the uh, factory patches installed right now because um mm, I, I don't want to um they they do sound cool and some of them are electric piano sounds some of them are kind of clever and helicopters and noise and, and bells and whistles some sounds like a freight train with a ringing bell and it's toot 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 toot, toot. you know it's actually very um it can be complex you know and create some very interesting sound effects but i i was more impressed with pro i wanted to get into programming the thing and making sounds okay so um anyway jumping ahead um uh way in history after the many years it's lasted all eight voice cards are fine um everything's working great uh but my cpu was um the batteries were starting to uh leak acid that's a problem that plagues all chromas the cpu is uh right under here and it's big it's a big cpu that connects by a ribbon cable to another board and it has two double a batteries sitting in there and they, they will leak over time and then just completely annihilate the computer and then you're left without a chroma and that's it so i'm sure there's plenty of people still well not plenty since there's only been 3,000 made they have them in their garage somewhere with a failed computer board well um david clark uh and if i'm missing anybody I, you can go to the Rhodes chroma site you know um uh, he ships from canada a brand new um uh, board and it doesn't require batteries it's half the size it's it's very small so it's moved over on these mounting rails that are underneath here facing up it's about that big you know it's it's not big at all you know it's a it's a card and it's got a an updated processor it's very well made uh, so one of these guys like i said these technicians that work with this community of these chromas uh whoever worked with him on this has saved the day for the chroma. I mean, just literally uh, resurrected the chroma. And um, so that was the first thing I purchased as an upgrade, I, b I believe. I believe that was the first thing. The, actually, the first thing I purchased was uh, a, a Syntec uh, interface, a, a MIDI interface. So it would be, so I could MIDI it, you know? But that wasn't doing much good because I didn't have an editor. And what I was really interested in was getting into this in more depth. Because to program it, you have to select one of these, you know, low pass, high pass. Okay, I've selected. Now i got to look on this little tiny readout here. Move this one lever and select one or two, you know, low pass or high pass. And then it'll, you'll hear the sound change. And then if you want to change something else, you have to go to something else. And then if you want to do a filter sweep, it's not that easy. You have to select the filter and then do the filter sweep with this or assign it to one of the uh, mod uh, flippers here, these little levers, you know. And uh, there's two. And then over here is an e equalizer and a, a tune, a general kind of tune thing. But... So that that was the first one, I think, was the Syntec MIDI interface. And I think I bought one of the last ones that was on the guy's shelf that was producing those. And, and um, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting your name right now. But, uh, I mean, like I said, RhodesChroma.com. If you want to know where to get the upgrades for the Chroma, to really uh, just turn your chroma into something that will last that's the resource you go to and of course i'll make follow-up videos to get more into depth on how to program it 
So that was the first um, upgrade I got. And then I started playing with it, and it, I became very enthralled with the sound of the chroma. It's unlike any other synth. Everybody says that about every synth, but truly the chroma has a sound that is unique. Um, there's, there's synthesizers you can say that about that really stand out in the way they sound, you know, like the Yamaha CS80, you know, and the Rhodes Chroma, the Prophet 5, the Mini Moog, of course. Uh, even some of the virtual analogs and digital synths that have been around have their own voice. The Yamaha DX7, look at this, for goodness sake. I mean, it's kind of, it looks like a big TX8, TX7, whatever it's called. It's it's just kind of burp, burp. And when you see it, you're like, oh, what does it do? I don't know. It just got a bunch of membrane buttons, like a DX7. Um, but when you get into it uh, and you hear it, it has a sound unlike any other synth. And so we're going to hear about a little bit about that. But you got to wait for me to satisfy my need to speak. <laughs> and uh, let me just take another glass of water or drink of water here. Okay. I mean, I could pause while I'm doing that. I could pause the whole thing, but what what would the point in that be? So, uh, okay. So the second thing I got was the Dave Clark um, and company, whoever helped design, um, upgrade in the CPU. I immediately switched it out. I did it by myself. I took this apart, and I it just unplugs the old board, which was this big, unplugs with that ribbon cable that connects the other board in here, and you just installed the new one, which is tiny in size, doesn't require batteries, and it holds three patch banks. You know, it it it, it it's uh, so there's um what, what would that be 150 patches right. Um, so I'm great, you know, it was great, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so, uh, I was programming it, and making sounds and things, and it was, it was wonderful, and then it went on the fritz, and so I found out it was the power supply, so I believe I took it back to Wes again, and he, he fixed up the power supply, and he, you know, calibrated and everything, but he told me how terrible it was. I mean, it, it is. It weighs like 10 pounds and it's, you know, it's got a big old, big old power converter, whatever in there. And it just, um, it heats up and it causes the voices to detune. And it also sends out erratic um, voltages so it can fry the brain of your chroma and fry your boards and fry and that's also what has happened to many chromas is just total failure you know fail you know there's no fail safe device it just fries the whole thing so um i looked into uh luca sistelli i hope i'm saying that right sistelli luca sistelli from italy and his um, uh, switching power supply unit. Uh, so the old power supply is, you know, big. I mean, if you take the whole thing together, it's like as big as a loaf of bread, I guess. And, you know, it's not the same shape, but it's big. It sits back under where that laptop is, I guess. And, um, and but the Lucas Sistelli one is small it's it's nice it's about as big as a uh, well as big as this i guess and silver it's got cooling holes in the nice shiny metal and it's light and it mounts on a piece of uh like maple or something and and it does not send out erratic voltages it does not get hot and it's perfect and um and so getting that installed uh, really made a huge difference uh, with all sorts of things. It solved problems I was having, like erratic messages, error messages, tuning messages, 
Uh, I don't know if that was the solution. I'm not a tech. I mean, I can fix mechanical things, and I can, I could have even uh, installed my power supply, but I, I chose not to after my experience with my, my memory Moog, which Wes Taggart still has, by the way. He is, um, he's doing me a great favor by, uh, I shouldn't be broadcasting. He doesn't do favors to everybody that asks him, you know, so it's like, don't, don't call him and say, do me a favor, man. Uh, just because I said that, but no, he really is. He's spending time on the thing because he's the only one on the planet that I think will be able to figure out what I did to screw up my memory Moog because I replaced all the ribbon cables in it. I did it right, but something happened. I think it was probably um, static. So, (laughs) and with that, you can just, it's like an aneurysm in the synthesizer. So I'm not prepared to go into here anymore. Uh, I'm just going to say if it's, if it's mechanical, I'll do it. You know, if, if I like my other chromas, I'll supply the, uh, I'll put in the sub power supply and the, and the, the CPU, the CC plus CC plus. Okay. And, um, I'll do that, and I'll even install the wood. But it, when it comes time to calibrating my my boards, eight boards, dual voice boards, no, I'm not going to mess with it, or anything else for that matter. Sam Masuko at Three Wave Music is a genius, and he's close now. I'm not close to Wes, um, close to Sam, and Sam knows exactly what he's doing. As a matter of fact. Sam knows how to fix the membrane switches. What? Say what? Yes, he does. And uh, and he knows how to do it. And um, so, yeah, I won't let anybody else do that. So now, getting more into detail about the chroma. What you see in front of you is, um, like I said, a fully refurbished chroma. All eight voices are working. Um, it's an analog synthesizer, of course, and it has um, is two oscillators, you know, dual oscillator, dual voice boards, eight of them. So if you put it in a single oscillator mode, or, or you put it in, um, um, you can increase the polyphony, but to sixteen notes. Okay, so you can have sixteen note polyphony, but but I usually have it on the dual layer setup. And um, um, did I say dual layer? Um, I don't know why I said, oh, I said dual layer because I was thinking of dual layer DVDs. <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, um, so let's hear. I'll call up some things on my computer. And so there's what is called the channel mode. Uh, the 16 channel mode is... One oscillator through filter through amplifier. Okay, and in 16 channel mode, you can do a lot, a lot of things. And so I have a lot of sounds programmed. Like I think this patch bank is just me, my programs, where it's just one oscillator through a filter through an amp modulated by the LFO or sweep, sweep, and the, um, the filter envelope, the volume envelope, and those things like that. And then everything is mod- modulatable. Modulable. So, okay, so when you get the CC+, Plus, it, it, it adds MIDI capability as well. You don't need the Syntec MIDI interface, which I still have, by the way. It's a little box, and it, it has a ribbon cable, and there's some what look like SCSI ports uh, in the back of the Chroma. It used to have an Apple computer that you could get that would sit on top of it. And you could do things like sequencing and stuff with a big old, old Apple computer. And it would plug in with the computer interface to the back. Well, they made that Syntec mid interface fit that socket. and so. But the, uh, the uh, CC Plus adds MIDI capability and it runs to the back of the uh, Chroma. And it comes out and you have two MIDI jacks three sorry in out and through and with that and with the capability of the new computer 
you don't have to program using the parameter control knob uh, and, um, and, and do one at a time. You can hook it up to a iPad. There's a, uh, a template for the iPad, but I don't opt for that because, I mean, I mean, here I have the iPad and I'm trying to turn a knob with a virtual knob on a screen with my fingers or two at the time, or maybe I'll lay it here and try to turn two as I'm playing. No, I want to be able to reach up and actually turn two knobs and then play and reach and turn this and this real quick. I don't want to have to try to page through a series of stinking iPad things. Now, that's just a preference of mine, and I'm not making fun of people who do that. I just think they're wrong and, and silly. Um, you know, that's just my opinion, <laughs> and I'm allowed to have that opinion because... I'm, I'm free. So, um, okay. So with the ability to reach in and program with that MIDI and the, the CC plus, which makes available every parameter to control, um, you can up, hook up a few things now, uh, s especially things that deal with SISIC system exclusive messages. Uh, things that can be programmed to communicate with the Chroma, like the Behringer BCR2000 Rotary Controller. Okay, and Behringer, what is, who owns Behringer? Probably Sam Ash or something. I don't know who owns Behringer now, but whoever owns Behringer, uh, you know, this can be used to control lighting, stage lighting. You can control it to uh, use virtual synthesizers, and you can use it to, uh, so if you've got a synth on your computer, you can hook this in the MIDI, and, and you can learn this to turn the knobs on your virtual Profit 5 on your computer, let's say. And so it could be used for a lot of different stuff. But for me, it won't ever be. It's going to be always to use to control the chroma and this brain and whatever is going on in here. So there's that. And then um, just to explain what you're seeing here, this laptop is just for my convenience because I have um, cheat sheets. Um, because even if you have knobs, and, and I have overlay for this BCR that I just bought, uh, very nice guy named uh, Jamie Downing created um, this type of plastic, this type of membrane plastic. I don't remember what it's called technically, but, you know, it's what you see on um, Moog's, you know, that thick black plastic sticker. Well, he made that plastic that basically mimics the um, the same font and the same graphics and the same colors and such to um, mirror these um, program select parameter select switches. You can select programs. When it's in parameter select mode you can select what parameter you're changing. You know, your modulating depth for your your, uh, your you know, for your uh, that controls your cutoff let's say from an LFO or whatever, your envelope attack time decay release, sorry, attack decay release. All right, so those overlays would stick on here. I just haven't stuck them on here yet. I have them. I have two sets because eventually there'll be another Behringer sitting right next to this because this Behringer will only control oscillator A, um, or oscillator B. Uh, it depends. You just switch a button, and now all these knobs are controlling B. You switch this back, and now they're controlling A. Or if you have things programmed to be modulated by B, and they're, they're modulating A, you have to switch to B, and then adjust that, and switch back to A. And But but really, it's it's not as complex as it sounds. Because imagine, you know, you have, what is it? I don't remember here exactly. There's over 70 controls here on this surface, including the buttons. Uh, I believe that's right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 16, 24, 32, uh, 
for one, for two, for three, four, five, six, seven, for eight, for nine, six, one, two, sixty-two. Okay, sixty-two. Sixty-two controls times two. Okay, what is that? Uh, um, one hundred and twenty-four. But some of these don't count, so let's just say 115 or whatever. I don't know. 115 knobs. Now, that, that tells you something, knobs and switches, that inside this chroma there's a lot of power and potential. Okay, so that's one of the benefits of one of the upgrades. The power supply, enough said. I mean, it just makes it stable and it'll be running for a long time. The build quality on that uh, power supply is amazing. I mean, it's really great. I mean, I saw it for the first time. I was like, wow, this is, this is handmade, and it's, it's got really, it's really close tolerance, and it was made in Italy, and it's, you know, just beautiful. So if you've got a Chroma, do not delay to get those upgrades, or else, you know, God forbid, Luca gets struck by a, you know, a, a, a minibus or something, you know, or David Clark stops making uh, the CC Plus because he, he's gone insane from, you know, trying to figure out where the wires are going and he can't figure it out anymore. God forbid. We don't want that to happen to David Clark. He's a wonderful man. Look at my hands. I'm, I'm saying it. He's a wonderful man. So anyway, um, do not delay to get those upgrades. Um, because if you do and you miss out, it's going to blow. And, um, and if you do have a Chroma and you're not willing to get the up upgrades, for goodness sake, sell it to me because uh, I'll do it. It's like owning a rare automobile and I'm willing to put the money into refurbishing it because I know that this can fetch... Uh, anywhere between six and eight thousand dollars now so uh, you know w but I'm never going to sell this one unless I need a kidney or uh, something like that and then I would sell it of course so the benefits being that and, and I, I could have waited to have the other Behringer hooked up but frankly I don't have it programmed to control oscillator B, you can daisy chain them. You know, you can um, you can daisy chain them, and then they'll work. One controlling A and one controlling B, so you don't have to switch this switch. But heck, I mean, just with this alone, it is a, it's a jump in evolution of the chroma, and so uh, you know you can really do some stuff with it. All right, so. Um, It's, uh, I'm trying to figure out what I'm, what, what I was about to say and where I am. Okay, I'm in the, I'm in the living room. All right, now, I'm going to pull up my cheat sheets and, um, let's get, get the ones that I want to look at. Uh, right now I'm in a dual oscillator mode. And, um, if I flip through my cheat sheets, it shows me what each mode is. Like, um. And I'm going to get into this in another video, but basically it's like having one, two, um, three, four, five, five, I guess, synths in one, synth setups, you know, there's series filter mode, there's more to it than it, than it sounds like. In each one of these modes, there's no cross modulation it's just straight up oscillator and oscillator b routing in different ways through the two different filters and then out one amp or some other way then there's the sync you can have sync in there and you get that classic sync sound or ring mod ring modulation then there's filter uh frequency modulation you know like um the profit five and it's a uh, poly mod section that's frequency modulation and um FM, you know, you can have that, analog FM. And um, so in every one of these modes, no matter what they are, 
uh, you have those options. No cross modulation, sync, ring mod, or filter FM. Um, except I think in, well, of course, in uh, the 16 channel mode, which is um, still pretty, pretty doggone cool. All right, so now I'm going to get to playing something on the chroma. Now, this is just a sound. First of all, I'm going to tune it um, because I've been sitting here talking. Now, it will flash lights. You might not be able to see that, but it just flashed lights. Um, I have an error, but nothing is wrong. Um, it's, I mean, there's something wrong somewhere. And, you know, we're, I'm, I'm taking it to my friend Sam and he's going to look at it and he, you know, I think it's my, uh, pink noise, um, on one of my cards. Uh, that's what it is. I, I don't know if I will get an error message from it, but they all play, all voices play and they're in tune. So everything just tuned up. There's an auto tune, just like the Prophet 5 does. It kind of blinks. Dun, 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 dun. And uh, it, it'll tune all eight cards. And it's ready to play. And so this was just a, a sound I was messing with last night. So I, I have nothing prepared and don't expect Keith Emerson here. So... <laughs> Okay, so that's that's a sound. Okay, that's um, kind of a Vangelis sound. I, I really like Vangelis, uh, but I don't like every album he's produced. I mean, when he started making orchestra music and trumpets and stuff, I said, Nah, I don't want that. But it, um, it, but he's a very great. He's a great composer, and you know, he would say, Ah, I don't care, and I say the same thing. Yeah, so it's like uh, I have um, maybe. I enjoy his early works, not his his real early works, but like, you know, opera, sauvage, I guess how you say it, sauvage, sauvage, opera sauvage. I love uh, soil festivities, I mean, just beautiful music, synthesizer, pure synthesizer stuff, where he'll just be... And of course, he has other stuff on top of something like that. I'm not evangelist, and so don't claim to be. I'm just, you know, I got it's got that kind of vibe, you know, I suppose. And um, so there's an example of a sound. That's a dual oscillator setup. It's just the simple setup, and it's um, in the Rhodes Chroma. That would be number, what is it? Let's see. That would be, it's not the 16 channel mode, it's the independent channel mode where oscillator A runs through filter A and it goes out amp A. And oscillator B goes through filter B and goes out amp B and then they mix together and go out the output, right? So you can detune A from B and, and I've done that here. I think it's a, uh, what is that, a fifth? Can we can we hear that? I don't know. I don't remember. It was last night.
Okay, so you get the idea. Now, in the uh, chroma, and as I said, I'm not going to go into great detail, but I want to display the chroma as an introduction. I'm just going to leave it in this mode and just mess around with this patch. I'm going to do the mess around. I'm going to do the mess around. Mess around. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and in order to do that, yes, every knob is labeled uh, on the overlays. And then there's even paper overlays that you can print out and just kind of cut out the thing and just lay it over and it'll tell you mod 3 depth, wave shape, width, mod select. But the thing is, when you have mod select printed under one of these knobs, like let's say I want to change um, what modulates the, uh, the cutoff. Well, heck, there are Let's get to the mod select page. Let's make sure we're counting them right. There are 16 different um, things that you can modulate the cutoff with. And there are three um, there are three choices. Uh, there are three ways you can modulate that cutoff. So uh, you can modulate it with the LFO and then adjust that. Then, then there's another knob. You can choose one of those 16, which is listed on one of my handy uh, cheat sheets, because I can't, frankly, cannot memorize those 16 parameters because there's other parameters too, and they're not conveniently printed on those overlays. I mean, the overlays are wonderful and they're beautiful, and uh, Jamie did a a beautiful job on these overlays, and if you missed out, well. Ha, 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 and you. Um, I got me too. And, and maybe he'll print some more if enough people will uh, request them. That's what he said. I think he needs an order of, uh, like, I, I don't remember, a minimum order at least. Because you can imagine the cost. But it doesn't have every available thing. For instance, there's, uh, let's see, what is this? Eight, 16 LFO wave shapes. I don't always remember what all 16 are. I mean, on the overlays, it'll show. It shows square wave, lag square, step, uh, step triangle, uh, random uh, sign, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, it just goes through the whole gamut of, um, you know, just LFOs that you don't see a selection of, like that in LFOs except maybe on, uh, I can think of a few um synthesizers like the um, uh, when the Trinity came out the Korg Trinity uh, it had lots of LFOs and then the the prophecy um, the Korg prophecy um, has more LFOs than the Korg Z1 actually so people who say it's the same it's it's not the same it doesn't even have the same filter but you know people believe what they read so but whatever it's got 16 LFOs and then you know so if you want to modulate the pitch same thing you have three ways you can modulate the pitch and then you have 16 things you can modulate it with you can modulate with oscillator 2's LFO or both oscillator A and oscillator 2 uh, LFO or you can modulate it with the uh, the uh, sweep that is the um, uh, the the keyboard stretch um, you can you can uh, uh, I'm sorry uh, that's a mistake the LFO is the sweep um, you can um, keyboard glide which would be the uh, you know to modulate the uh, the um, cutoff frequency uh, key scaling you know um, higher tones than the bottom and so uh, you can adjust that keyboard. You can use LFO. You can use envelope one, um, which would be in oscillator A, there's two envelopes. Okay, so you could use either one or the other one to, to adjust attack, decay, and release. There is no sustain on the chroma. There's just ADR. And that makes sense when you start programming it. And then you can adjust um, what modulates 
the attack. And there's, there's options for that as well. So, um, and so there's a lot of, lot of parameters and you do need a parameter sheet or some type of reference unless you have a, a, a very good memory and you spend a good month to memorize what every one of them does. Is that a motorcycle or is it, is it me dreaming? If you hear anything in the background, there's, I live in the heartland, so there's people that really love their motorcycles and their freedom. And doggone it, don't we all? I hope. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm sorry for my ums. These are weak words. I realize this, but if I have a sp public speaking engagement, I make sure to keep myself from saying um and I meet out my words correctly. But I'm at home and I'm gonna um I'm gonna take my time and say um things that make you say um. Alright, so let me see if I lost my place. If I lost my place, you can start laughing, but so far I've not lost my place. So unless you memorize all these parameters, uh, you need some sort of cheat sheet. And I just put them conveniently on this Alienware laptop. You know, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying it's an Alienware. You know, just a little old simple Alienware. And um, I can page through them. And you, you might not be able to see that clearly. I can't actually see my can without looking at my camera to see what you're seeing. So I don't care. But anyway, then there's the... Um, then there's the CC plus functions, things that you can tell the computer what to do. Like, for instance, you can create a scratch patch, a scratch pad. It'll set everything to basically a sawtooth and the filter's wide open and it says beep, beep, beep. And then you start building your patch from there. That's very handy. Uh, it's a CC plus function. You press a button here. It's a set split function, it's called. You press the set split button and press one of these parameters to do that and it'll automatically you'll have a beep 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 and then you can start playing with the knobs and build a patch from there you can create a random uh, patch and some of those end up being very interesting I think every uh, synthesizer should come with a random patch uh, generator I personally I think that if it doesn't have a random patch generator I don't want it. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, that's it. I don't even want to. I don't even want to talk about synthesizers that don't have a random patch generator. I'm not even going to talk about them. That's how bad I feel about that. I don't even want to say it, say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not even going to mention it. That's how bad that I feel about that thing there. Okay, so there's other functions, the CC plus, but you have to remember them all. And unless you have a cheat sheet like this, well, heck, there's, well, let's count them. There's 50 here. Uh, then the, then there's, uh, heck, there's another 3, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, sorry, uh, 18, 22, 26, 27, something like that. Another 27. So we're talking about 77 uh, functions that are hidden in the computer like um, how you want to send a program packet out let's say if you want to do a sysix dump you fill up all three banks of your patches and you would want to dump them out into the computer to save them like into something like midi ox or uh, you know a bohm's uh, midi uh, device whatever it's called or um, i just like uh, sysix um, um, Sysix, I think it's called, uh, for the Macintosh. I use that on an old Macintosh laptop to dump my programs out when I've loaded them up. So I can always just dump back in MIDI. Nice and safe. No more cassette deck fails. No more the volume up is too loud and you get an error and you're trying to load them and it gets to number 49 and then it shows error. And then you got to start again and adjust the volume on the cassette deck. No, you can do that. But you, you can check the battery 
um, you can press a set split and it'll show you, uh, but this doesn't have a battery anymore, right? But it's still there. It's still available, I guess. You can test all of the LEDs. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but that, that would be a set split um, 30. And so let's see if you can see that. Uh, I'll just try to cover. Let's get something to, uh, to cover that. And a piece of paper. Darken this a bit. Um, it's not working really well. All right, I'll do a set split 30. Let's go ahead and do that. Now it's just lit up all the LEDs. I think you can see them pretty good here. They're all lit up. Every LED is lit up. Um, and that means all my LEDs are lit up. And I think if I press 30 again, um, I, well, well, I just blew away my, my nice sound, but that's okay. Um, whatever. I forgot how to exit out of the set split 30 for a second there, and I pressed the wrong button. Anyway, that's why you need these references. You can mute oscillators to find problems. You can um, mute A channel or B channel to do, you know, um, you can do troubleshooting. You can um, choose which programs you want to send, uh, send out. You can, you, can, uh, you can kill a bad board. That is, you can just completely shut it off if there's a bad board and uh, one of your voice boards is gone, which is kind of a, a bad thing. It kind of blows. But for some guys out there who know how to repair them, it's not a big problem. Me, I don't. I have to beg uh, these dudes to give me some information, and you know they never do. So it's like you're left with, uh, you got to go to a repair shop. So um, I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm just saying that's that's how it goes. Then you can reset the main computer. It'll it'll cycle through, return, tune it, and just make sure everything is cleaned up and it just it's just it's a it's a head check for the chroma. And that's what it does. Okay, so there's a lot of functions hidden in there that these knobs cannot control. Um, someday maybe uh, there'll be um, I don't see the reason for it, but uh, maybe a, another device, a BCR, that can do that. Then there's the CC plus functions that take advantage of the new CPU. Um, you can show your voice allocation. Uh, you can create that spat, uh, spatch patch, scratch pad. Um, you can set your, your MIDI channel, um, uh, you know, l the levers, the polarity of the levers, uh, the foot switches, um, um, MIDI pressure mode. Okay, so in other words, there's a lot of um, things you can do to to uh, to do lots of things. All right, great. So the only thing I have left to install on this is the polyphonic aftertouch. Okay, the CS80, um, I like Vangelis, again, uh, I'm not in love with him, but I, I guess I love his music, you know, and his, and his cute ponytail, but um, Vangelis loved the CS80, and, and loves it probably still to this day, and there's a good reason for it, because it's so doggone expressive. If you listen to Vangelis' music, you're not listening to just something that has been plugged in to a Korg Triton Extreme sitting over there, and it's operating this to go with a filter sweep. No, he's he's at these controls.
and so there's expressiveness um, in the ability to reach up and do things, obviously, in real time in a performance. And you will hear that uh, all through, especially uh, Vangelis's own particular technique that he developed to record in, uh, his synthesizer music uh, in his studio. I mean, if you look at pictures of him, he's seated in the middle of a bunch of synthesizers surrounding him, and they all have a good interface. And he spins on that chair, if you see any videos, and he's constantly turning and twiddling. He knows exactly what he's reaching for. At the, you know, He knows exactly what parameter to change, and a lot of it is improvisation. So he's sitting there improvising because he has such a, a, a you know, he has such of a, a, a collected uh, uh, knowledge of, of music and um, and how he wants to express himself. He know he knows very well, and so he he can turn and, and spin around in that little chair in his control console in the center of his little universe there, and he can uh, he can create. Uh, compositions that are just wonderful and um, but the thing about the CS80 is being his uh, favorite instrument um, it's it always had a prime spot in his in his rig now I'm not speaking for him he might write me and say that wasn't my favorite instrument it was the uh, you know uh, Roland JD800 you know he liked that one as well but the thing that set apart the CSA is that polyphonic aftertouch. So that means you can press down, and you if, you, if I press harder, you know what aftertouch is. It, it can open the filter more. And as you release it, it closes the filter, and you can control it. But most keyboards, if you have a chord and you're doing that, and you have that chord playing, you press down one note harder, just one note as you're holding down the whole chord all notes will it will affect that that uh, modulation to the filter or the pitch or whatever it's set to do and it's not polyphonic aftertouch it's it's uh it's monophonic aftertouch it's just regular old aftertouch you know whatever you press here is affecting whatever is being held down here if you press harder. Now this still has velocity without that. I mean, and that's, you know, that's independent. That is a, oh, there's a phone call. Well, I'm not going to answer it. You know that? I'm just going to turn it off. Well, no, I, th I think that gives it a kind of a, an air of, um, you know, reality um, to this whole thing. There's a real phone. I'm a real person. I'm important. Um, okay, it's time for water. All right, so so we're up to an hour. Don't drink the tap water. It's not a new age thing. It's just that it's doggone bad for you. Anyway, um... Okay, so there is a, I have a, the pressure bar, which came as an option for the chroma. It's just this, this long bar that is underneath the keyboard uh, that allows it to have polyphonic aftertouch. Now, even at the time when they offered that, that wasn't, you know, that was great. You know, you could program it, but you didn't have this. Now, the CS80 had all of this plus more knobs and levers, and you could control ring mod and do crazy immediate things and changes. And you had polyphonic aftertouch. So as you're playing and performing, you could, you could apply a filter sweep by sticking down on this note while keeping these, these relatively, you know, with a lower tone. It would sound like that if I was pressing harder on it. Or if just one note, it would only affect the one note. So that's what, that is the true beauty of polyphonic aftertouch. Now, try to find 
polyphonic aftertouch. There's polyphonic aftertouch controllers now coming out. There are companies that are making them for uh, virtual synths that are made to uh, utilize polyphonic aftertouch. Because people are starting to realize more and more after the craze of um, virtual instruments that you need a little more immediacy for control. And you do need a control surface. And you do need uh, a real expressive and delightful keyboard, which this is. It's weighted, wooden keys. Uh, it has a very good feel to it. It's not a synthy keyboard. It's a, it has, um, it's, they're heavy, wooden, long. They go through it like a piano keyboard. It's a, a very nice, exquisite, really, um, feel to it. Uh, very even. They're not like all jiggly. Um, and so if you have that, and I have one that is ready to be installed. Now, I didn't wait for it. It's going to be installed within a month. And I ordered it, and if you want to know how to get one of those, you go to the Rhodes Chroma website. Chris Borman, right? So Chris Borman makes those. And so I, I made sure to snag a couple of those up because he was he, he was basically saying that he's not going to make any more unless he gets an order of, uh, I think, five or more. And so uh, I've got a few Chromas that I'm planning to refurbish completely, and I'm going to do my part to get that, uh, get him ready for that build. And if you're out there, you do your part. Even though this is not, let's hope it's not connected to the internet. I just don't like it being connected to the internet. The other machine is connected to the internet. This one is air-gapped. So, um, so with all of that capability in front of you, the Chroma immediately becomes... A CS80. Um, obviously, that's going a little far, but it, it becomes very relevant and very important and powerful polyphonic instrument, a analog synthesizer. You know, just take one of these, put it next to here, envision all the knobs, envision all the capabilities, all the set split functions, and what you have is a real masterpiece in synthesis that m very few people know about, actually, the Rhodes Chroma. What they see on YouTube is they see the Cherry Wood Council. They may even see the Chroma Expander, which I don't have a Chroma Expander. I, w I would like one someday, but I don't need one. Frankly, I, I in the way that I play, uh, what I'll usually have on top is my Nord Lead 1. Um, yes, I love the Nord Lead 1. Not the two. I love the Nord, and it fits perfectly on top. And the control is over here, and and I just like playing those two at the same time. I don't really need the expander, but some people do, and some some people have the whole setup. Um. And um, now I forgot where I was. Oh, on YouTube you'll see. Uh, no, I didn't. Ha <laughs> ha. So uh, on YouTube you'll see videos where, you know, it'll be some synthesizer repair company um, or some, uh, there's one good video that I found uh, so far. And it's by some guy, I'm not going to say his name, but he made a song using the chroma. And uh, it's a pretty cool song, but he's actually playing it. And um, he's made a song with it, but he doesn't get into, he doesn't talk. It's just a video of his song. And the chroma's being utilized. And that's cool, you know. But as far as I know, nobody has created a video like what I'm creating right now. And that kind of blows, I think, because it's been around for so long. But hey, who am I to pick on anybody? I mean, I'm just some dude who uh, who was making the video. And so um, to demonstrate the chroma... Uh, is a is a privilege really it's it's to show people it's not just to boast you know I mean we all like to show off our gear and if you wanted to see my back studio I could show you some pretty cool gear but um, but I this is probably I'm gonna say it I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that it, 
is this will be my favorite instrument when I get the pressure bar um, installed. Actually, you can install it yourself. It's not a, but I'm going to get Sam to install it because he's uh, he's a good guy and uh, he knows exactly what he's doing. And, and then it it enables a bunch of features, obviously. So then you can assign what you want that aftertouch to control, pitch and things, cut off and whatever. And so you, you know the mod levers, foot switches that are under my feet that I can switch from one program to the next by just clicking a foot switch. Then I have a volume pedal and you know you can set different switches to do different things. Um, you've got a really expressive instrument for somebody who wants to play um, just a solo live performance and record it and then build on that you know do multi-tracking or whatever or if I got my Nord up here I can do that too which has lots of nice knobs so that's what's so great about it but most of the time on the videos you see on YouTube and this isn't just a matter of self-promotion it's just a an observation that you will see uh, to be true uh, is just going through the factory presets and and not real programming um, However, there is one guy that I'm leaving out, and he makes what is called the, um, oh, what is it called? No, I forgot it. Anyway, it's a, I'll, I'll remember it, but it's a beautiful, it, it's after the cherry wood or whatever wood you really want to design. It's a great big, huge box that basically comes up here, and it has all the knobs on it with all these graphics on it and it's made out of hardwood on the sides and the same wood to match and it fits perfectly on your chroma and it's um, the enabler it's called the enabler but it's um, what is it three grand you know and if you got the money get an enabler I mean man it's beautiful and if you look on YouTube for a chroma enabler um, you'll see him really kinda show you what the enabler can do, but but also how the chroma sounds, you know, obviously, uh, and so he's come close to to really demonstrating that. But um, uh, I mean, it's basically an advertisement for the enabler, and and it should be because that thing is is beautiful. And if I had the money, uh, which I don't, uh, and I don't, uh, and if I had the money, I, I think I I might buy one for just this chroma. But the other chromas would have. BCRs because they work to me just as well. It's just it serves my purpose. So that's what's out there for the chroma, and that's what that's what I find useful about the chroma. And so I'm here to explain all of that, and then to now, I guess get into. Um, let me just recap and see if I've missed anything. Uh, there is a. Uh, you can get the user manual. It gets into detail on how useful it is to route um, a series filter, you know, routing, or um, and why that you would want that. If you want to make sounds that sounds like a person's voice, like a wow, 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 you know, like it's talking to you. Oh, the chroma is is awesome for that. It'll do sounds that blow you away. It just really is great. And not only that, but it just has such. I don't know how, how to say it, a huge harmonic content in the output that when I play a...
Okay, so it, it, to me, when I hear that in my headphones, it's, a, it's just a, an enormous amount of um, harmonic uh, content, I guess, is the way I want, would want to put that. Okay, so um, I'm going to create a scratch patch, all right, and I'm going to look at my set split um, list because I'm forgetting. Um, it set split 39, and it's going to immediately set me to uh, a simple saw wave. Now, in the chroma, there are two waveforms. There is a square pulse, whatever, square wave. With, uh, and you can modulate the width. You can do pulse width modulation. And there is the saw. And then there's pink noise and white noise, okay, on each, each oscillator. And those pink noise and white noise are, are um, I believe, digitally, uh, I don't know, the t technically digitally sampled. They're digitally uh, based, produced, uh, I don't know generated okay so uh but the uh oscillators are analog the filters are analog and everything so you can choose saw or square so this will set us up into um into a scratch patch set split 39 okay so now i've got okay now you can hear this is just uh, an unmodulated saw, you can set the width for the saw wave too in the chroma. Now, when I first, uh, let's listen just to the, the full open saw wave beauty monstrosity of the chroma, you know. Okay, so you can uh, you can hear that it's a, it's a beautiful. Now, of course, I messed with the uh, resonance a bit there. I'll just turn down the resonance all the way, and I'll open up the filter again. Okay. You get it. <laughs> I could do that all day. Okay, I think I will do it all day. Sorry, just uh, go for some iced tea or something. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, all right, so oscillator uh, B. Let's go to oscillator B. I'm going to switch the BCR to control that. I'm going to go to uh, my cheat sheet. I'm going go to go to my cheat sheet here because I don't have the sticker on it. So um, I just got to keep myself in check here. I'm going to control the pitch. Let's see if I'm on a double oscillator. Okay, no, this is a single oscillator mode. So right now I have 16 note polyphony. And I'm just messing with uh, um, all 16 voices. Uh, so that means I'm not in a dual oscillator mode. I can't detune B from A. Obviously, it's just one oscillator. So I have full 16 note polyphony. So just to see what you can do with full 16 voice polyphony in that single oscillator mode, uh, the first mode, I'll, I'll demonstrate a couple of patches. Uh, and then I'll demonstrate programming some of those patches in that mode and then go through some of the more complex sounds you can make with a dual oscillator setup and then blow your mind completely with a freaked out, I'll flip this upside down and I'll play it with my toes. 
and then you'll see what really will happen. Then I'll go have a bottle of wine. 